Good evening, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connects, our fall season of 2016-2017. We're just getting going. This is our, fro our fourth webinar of the season, and we're thrilled to welcome back Mary Kay Goindy, who has uh, done many presentations for OTF Connects and other people as well, and uh, always brings a very thoughtful and mindful approach to her topic. So I'm really excited about um, hearing all about primary math tonight. Um, Mary Kay and I have worked together before, and I always put in my dibs to moderate Mary Kay's sessions. So I'm happy to be here tonight. So I'm going to turn my mic off and turn things over to Mary Kay. Welcome to her and to all of you. Hope we have a great night together. Thanks so much, Susan. And thanks, everybody, for spending an hour and a half um, with us. Um, I was really happy the Jays game ended in time because that was going to be a problem for me, possibly, but uh, we're all good. So thanks, Susan's put my Twitter in the chat and I have it uh, beside my name and if you have uh, a Twitter handle, if you want to type that in the chat now because perhaps the best thing you're going to get out of tonight is connecting with another attendee or another participant who has the same teaching assignment and you can start to network. Um, you know, many hands, light work, and all that stuff. So it's great to put your Twitter handle in the chat room, and that way helps us keep in touch a little bit. So tonight's talking about one strand of one division in the math curriculum. And um, the ideas I want to talk about, they're a little bit, um, they all blend together for me, so when I was putting this presentation together, it seemed a little bit of chicken and an egg. I didn't know what to talk about first, so I hopefully have done a, a, an order that makes sense to you. Let's go back and get the, uh, the, your participation happening already. If when you go to school tomorrow, you will be teaching either grade one, grade two, or grade three math, could you give me a green check mark? And if you'll be doing something else, a red X. And maybe if you've given me a red X, if you could type in the chat what it is, what your role is. Um, I know I have some FDK teachers here, but maybe there's some other support roles ha happening that I could address. Oh, Rhonda, I was a consultant, math consultant for a while too, so I should connect with you. Okay, wow. Perfect. Just seeing this all go. So I'll try and make sure that I address some of these other jobs and, and make connections to these areas. Um, moving on. So I think in the blurb I, I said that um, this presentation would help you to best facilitate a student-centered problem-solving classroom. So my question to you is, what is a student-centered problem-solving classroom? Grab the mic, grab a chat, just get your ideas out so that we can make sure we're starting from the same page. So what is a student-centered problem-solving classroom? And grab the mic. It's way easier than talking, or than typing, sorry. Student interests and abilities, part of the planning, awesome. Exploring, hands-on, explaining, I think it's students making choices, rich conversation, wow. Sorry, go I ahead. I was going to say, I think it's posing open-ended problems as well for the children to solve. Awesome. Lots and lots and lots of math talk. Meeting students where they are. Yes, encouraging. Great. So there hasn't been anything typed that I disagree with, so that's kind of reassuring that we're all kind of starting on the same page in terms of what it means to run a student-centered problem-solving classroom. So the other part that we're talking about, number sense. What is number sense? We say it all the time, we write it down, we, it's in our curriculum. What's number sense and what is numeration? What's your understanding of that? And maybe you haven't even thought about what those words specifically mean. Again, in the chat or with the mic, what do these terms mean?
This is me practicing wait time. Perfect. It, it is different than the arithmetic that most of us were taught. Arithmetic is definitely part of number sense enumeration, but it can't be all. Number sense enumeration um, includes so much more. It's more than just the, the naming of numbers or, or the, the four basic operations, although it definitely includes that. So, um, because I was a curriculum leader, uh, I always go back to the curriculum. And everything that you do in your math class should come from this document, not, not another document like a textbook, but this is the starting. And if you haven't yet read the front matter of this curriculum, even though it's old, it's new math from uh, 11 years ago, um, the front matter, I think ex specifically pages 24 and 25 about teaching through problem solving, really good professional reading to help you understand how to best teach math for students to best learn math. And um, the processes, really important that we, we coach students to develop their math process skills. But um, that's a different presentation. And I have done presentations on, on those. So if you go back into the OTF Connects archives, you will find um, some of my ideas from the math processes and teaching through problem solving and, and all of that. So here's just a typical slide, a uh, typical page. It's from the grade one, number sense and numeration. And I just want to specifically say there's three overall expectations. So those are the expectations on which we have to base our assessment. In grade one and in all three of the primary grades, uh, the first one is quantity, the second one is counting, and the third one is operational sense. And then underneath where you see these overall expectations, that's where you're going to find your specifics. So there's a subheading called quantity relationships, and then they list the specific expectations that you might use to develop a student's overall expectation of quantity. And again, with respect to reporting, you report on the overall expectation. And then it's the um, specific expectations that provide examples or proof of how a student has achieved on that overall. Uh, if your colleagues teach grade four or five and feel that they do more work than you do, uh, it's true. Uh, grade four and five actually have four overall expectations because um, proportional reasoning uh, arrives in the number sense enumeration strand in grade four and stays through grade eight, but then counting disappears after grade five. So the grade four and five teachers in the province definitely do way more work than the rest of us. But it's these curriculum expectations that we have to really read carefully because um, I know for, for me, I would read them kind of quickly and get a sense of what I thought I remembered doing maybe when I was a student that addressed that topic or what possibly a textbook suggests. But really, it's when we read very closely and break it down, the expectations in our curriculum, that tells us what to teach and how to teach it and almost when to teach it as well. So there's lots of rich information here that maybe you've missed. Um, so for example, here I've just pulled out the expectations from number sense across the three grades as they relate to fractions. So I'll give you a second to just quickly read it over and maybe in the chat, um, with your voice or with your fingers, what do you notice about these expectations?
if you're not typing and you're reading the chat, I'm agreeing with all these concrete materials. And, and Nick talks about how the knowledge is scaffolded upwards through the grades. Um, emphasis on investigation. All, all great, great points. And somebody else is bringing up something else that I'm going to talk about in just a second. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. Feel free to keep talking about those ideas. So here's what we really need to pay attention to. For example, it tells us what kinds of fractions we should be dealing with. Uh, green check if you understand what a uh, fraction of a whole means. So green check if you can picture what fraction of a whole means. And I won't know if you put up a red X. I won't know what's from you, so I can just answer. Awesome. So you see then that in grade three, sorry, grade one and two, it's only fractions of a whole. And that makes up the entire work that those students are doing on fractions for assessment. It doesn't mean that you can never deal with fractions of a set in your class. Of course, if it arises, you're going to deal with it. But that won't be the basis of your assessment. But in grade three, notice how it changes. Not only are they doing fractions of a whole, but now they have sets as well. So fraction of a whole is the area model, where you're taking maybe a whole square and you're folding it into halves and quarters. And then fractions of the set are possibly you're pouring out um, all the cars in your class toy bin, and you're talking about fractions half of that set. And then we also go to fractions of a line, so the linear model as well. And there's a fourth one now that escapes my, my brain. So if somebody can think of the fourth type of fraction, I'll probably blurt it out in about 15 minutes when it comes to me. But um, so you see how specific that when we teach exactly what the curriculum says, we're preparing them for the next grade. And these ideas can really build. And so it's not just about teaching a procedure. It's about building a concept and the conceptual understanding of the student as they go through um, a topic. So here's another one. And somebody alluded to this or mentioned this specifically in the chat already. And I know that this doesn't happen a lot. And if you do it, like, it's not a big deal. But we just maybe want to refine our teaching and maybe increase the intentionality of our teaching to address the curriculum so that our students learn. Grade one, you use fractional names, half, quarter. Grade two, same. You only use the fractional names. It specifically says without using standard fractional notation, same as in grade three. So a student in primary would never be assessed given a fraction in standard notation such as this. People have challenged it, oh, but on EQAO they do. And when I was a curriculum leader, that was what I did. I went through all the past EQAO, primary EQAO. They never have a fraction in standard notational form. So it is really important, just like if the students are learning language or learning how to write, we build students' language through oral language first. So we have to use our words first, and then we start to represent it using more abstract symbols. This uh, standard fraction notation is very abstract to a student. They don't see that you're taking, you know, three holes and dividing it into four, or you're dividing one hole into four parts, and you're only referring to three of those equally sized parts. They don't understand that from looking at the symbol. So we need to build those concepts with them when we're just using words like halves and holes and quarters and, and things like that, so that when they do see this standard fractional notation, they have an anchor to hold um, those ideas down with. And here are some of the big ideas in the fractions. Really key in grade one that we drive home the point that fraction isn't just a whole divided into parts. It's a whole divided into equal sized parts. And I think a lot of times we speak um, less specifically in class than maybe we should. And it's important to get that idea that the parts have to be equally sized or they're not fractions. Um, 
Another big idea, uh, it comes up in grade two, where the more fractional parts you break a hole into, the smaller the fractional parts will be. That's like if you're asking a student if you have a pie and you divide one into fifths and one into quarters and you really like that pie, do you want one slice from the pie that's divided into quarters or one slice of the pie that's divided into fifths? And I've asked lots of grade seven and eight students that question and they don't know. They think, well, one slice is one slice. So I think that's just because we didn't do the job we needed to do in, in the primary grades to really build their understanding of what that whole denominator means and what it tells us about the fraction that we're going to be using or, or referring to. And the whole notion also comes up in grade two about comparing fractions. You can only compare fractions when the holes are the same size. And I have a story that I've told lots of times about uh, my grade seven class and I had two, uh, my hands were behind my back and I told the students that um, I had two halves of, no, I have a half a chocolate bar and a whole chocolate bar behind my back. Which would you like? And of course, I strategically picked a student to answer first, and um, I believe it was a he, and he said, well, I want the whole chocolate bar. So I held out a small Halloween-sized chocolate bar, and then to the other student, I gave half of a large Toblerone chocolate bar. And that really drove home the point that you can't compare fractions unless you um, know what the whole is. And I think they won't ever forget that. And I know a couple times people have seen me because it was when I taught in Alora on the street and said, oh, yeah, that Toblerone bar. So that's kind of what they remember from, from my class. So other things about fractions. I see somebody said that fractions make nervous. You're nervous. So let's we've got some time now is there something specific about fractions because I think we're going to go on to a, to another topic right after this but is there anything you want to clear up about primary fractions and I might not have the answer but I bet somebody else in the room will have a good thought about it Want to give me a happy face or thumbs up if you're ready to go on then? If you want to leave the idea of fractions and go on to something else. I don't want to rush. See lots of happy faces coming up. Smileys. All right. Ah, oh, the circular representation. That's awesome tends to be people ask questions about fractions and they say, but does it only work for pizzas? So uh, Alana raises the point, we can't always use the circle. We can have circles with fractions, but we should also have squares and rectangles and, you know, trapezoids and uglier shapes that we can fold in half easily and maybe not fold into quarters as easily. And that's getting to another point later on, but that just works into our whole geometry and that's that cross-curricular or cross-stranded bit of teaching which makes the math really rich because the way our curriculum is divided into strands, it's artificial. Math in the world does not exist in five strands. It just exists. It's a way of thinking. It's about looking for patterns and applying existing patterns to new situations. And so the more we can do that cross-strand teaching and bring it um, together, the, the more rich a student's understanding of, of math will be. So thanks for bringing up that point. Alana, was that what you were thinking too, that it's not always supposed to be about a circle? Oh, absolutely. You get the thirds and then when they start to draw fifths of a circle, it starts to get really wonky and then just because they haven't done it properly with a protractor, when they start to compare slices or sizes of the parts, it, it's not possible. So absolutely. And it does reinforce misconceptions. It's actually really easy to teach math badly 
not intentionally and not because we're being lazy, but just because we tend to use layperson's words and vocabulary or thinking when we're teaching a very specific math concept. And sometimes the two fight. I mean, we're supposed to make it real world and they're supposed to understand us, of course, but there's some really specific math concepts that if we just use everyday kind of, you know, the way, well, a kid says, or a, a mom says, a dad says to a child, I'll be with you in a minute. And then 10 minutes later, they get back to them, right? Child's going to have a hard time knowing what a minute is when they come to class. But those kinds of examples exist all over the math curriculum. So it's, it's really important that we start to be more intentional with the words we use. And I'll probably say that too many times tonight, but sorry. I'll apologize in advance. So here's um, another point that I wanted to bring up about the math curriculum, specifically about number sense. And the chart in the background is simply um, some of the operations, expectations. And then in the yellow, I've pointed out a quantity from grade two. And notice how the quantity supports the operation in grade three. So it's really important that in grade two, we specifically teach our grade two expectations all year so that they're well prepared for grade three. And if you do grade two really well, grade three is the student has what they need to go be successful. They won't know everything. That's, they're not supposed to. They're supposed to struggle with some of the concepts because that's the real learning. But it will um, leave them well prepared. Oh, sorry, I'm just reading this. <laughs> That's funny, Nick. Um, the other thing I want to point out is I've arranged these in two columns. Down the right of the table, these are the mental strategies. And down the left, they are strategies that get solved with concrete materials. Is there anything that you're noticing? Sorry, I've got a big yellow box in the way of the grade two one there. But maybe if you look at the grade, um, Two on the right and grade three on the, no, that's the wrong way. Grade, well, I've covered up the box, sorry. But I'll just make the point. What they do mentally is one grade behind what they do with concrete materials. So you'll notice that in grade three, mentally, they're uh, solving problems involving addition and subtraction of two-digit numbers, just mentally. In grade two, those are the types of problems that they should have been solving using concrete manipulatives and uh, algorithms, so paint, paper, pencil, and that kind of thing. So our curriculum is really thoughtfully laid out that the mental math comes after they have um, built the understanding, hopefully, quite solidly with manipulatives and, and recording it on paper. Please say that again, absolutely. So if you look at the chart, and these are just expectations that I pulled out of the curriculum in the operational sense. The ones I've written on the right are all what students should be solving mentally. So solve problems involving addition and subtraction. For example, in grade three, two-digit numbers using a variety of mental strategies. If that annoying yellow box, which was making another point but wasn't in the way, you would see that grade two, with manipulatives, they're supposed to solve uh, two-digit addition and subtraction questions. So the mental math in the expectations follows one year after they're supposed to deal with those kinds of problems using manipulatives. Grade two and one, absolutely. So grade two mentally, they're solving num whole numbers up to 18 mentally. Grade one, they're solving addition and subtraction problems, whole numbers up to 20 this time, using concrete manipulatives and concrete materials and drawings. So you can almost draw a diagonal line from the right column in grade two to the left column of grade one. And notice that the number range in those is the same. The difference is concrete materials versus mental strategies. Thank you. Why didn't I think of doing that? That's why there are two of us. Or was that somebody else other than Susan? Oh, that was you, Nick. Thank you. Awesome. Is that clear it up?
maybe green check with that polling tool if you're understanding that point or, or you now understand how aligned our curriculum is and how it just spirals. So the concepts, you're never teaching anything for the first time. The grade before, they've always had it. And that includes our, our FDK curriculum uh, too. Awesome. So counting. The counting expectations. I don't know if you've got your curriculum, um, if you can access it digitally. But maybe just take a minute. I'm going to take a sip of tea and look over the counting expectations for your grade show. And then maybe look at the grades on either side, the grade one and two. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about what you've noticed. So if you're noticing anything, start typing it or grab the mic. And I'll turn my mic off so you don't hear me slurp my tea. But I'll be back in like 30 seconds. And I don't want to rush you going through the curriculum, so maybe when you're ready to talk about it or you're, and you're not going to type anything, you'll put up a green check so we don't have dead air for forever and ever when, when you're ready to go on with something else. So in the chat, Nick was talking that um, notice that grade one tells you're only counting forwards. Grade two, you're counting by the same increments, but now you're also counting backwards. Anybody else noticing anything through the counting expectations? Yeah, counting by 25 to 1,000. That's a grade three expectation. The whole skip counting which is so important for having them really understand what multiplication means. Kids that can skip count do very well with their multiplication as a rule. Any other noticings? I see only five green check marks. <laughs> I agree with you, Kit. I don't know who has counted by unit fractions. Would not be great if we did. Ordinal counting. I think only up to the 31st, right? Which makes sense. Days of the month. OK, grade one does count backwards from 20. Awesome. Thanks for noticing that. Okay, so Lisa's saying that it's challenging to come up with interesting ways to practice with students. Anybody got an idea how you can have students be counting? Ah, absolutely. See, somebody's already pointing out the counting expectations align with the patterning expectations. Same big ideas. Maybe you don't need to teach a counting unit or a patterning unit. Maybe you just have a bunch of activities that kind of build both ideas at the same time. Again, the unit 
way to teach math doesn't help students understand it. It's just an organizational tool for teachers. And in fact, sometimes I think it actually hurts a child's understanding of math because they don't see the connection. Excellent. Count your steps in the hallway as you're going to an assembly. Ooh, Pokemon cards. Talk about engagement in a primary class. Graphing, again, that cross-strand connection. Jen, do you have a reason why you say grapefruit? Or was that just your favorite? Or was that on your desk when you made it up? I think that's awesome. And, and here's the thing, and, and it hasn't come up yet, or if it did come up in the chat, I missed it. But when we count, we shouldn't always start at zero. We should count by five starting at three. We should, you know, count by two starting at seven. We should use this whole broken number line a lot. We should use hundred charts a lot when we do our counting. And then when we're at the consolidation part of our lesson and, you know, as the teacher, we're bringing home the big idea, we're going to highlight the patterns, the patterns that we saw when we were counting by five starting at three. And how the pattern is different than had, what would it have been if we'd started at one or at zero. So a lot of times we have to be very careful that we don't always start um, at zero. Because most things in life, you're not starting at zero. You're, so it's that whole skip counting. At zero for sure to build their multiplication sense, but then starting at four and, and different numbers, just so they really practice the whole counting. And they're not just saying a rhyme. Because a lot of times when kids are counting, they could be thinking Jack and Jill went up the hill in their head. They're not picturing number at all. They're just saying a series of words that they know to say in order. And so we have to change it up for them so that they're really thinking about what it is they're doing when they're counting by five. You already brought it up that, um, you know, you have to count forwards. You're supposed to count backwards. It tells you how many, what increments you should count by. You don't count by 25 in grade one, but you do in grade three when you're getting assessment data. Some grade one student might count by 25s, and of course you're going to encourage them and let them go. But when you're coming up with their assessment, you're only focusing your attention on what they're doing when they're counting by ones, twos, fives, and tens. I know, Melissa, lots of people have never thought about counting other than without having a zero start. And when you ask students to count by twos, starting at three, they often will tell you, well, you can't because three is an odd number and you can't start there because they're just so used to two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, 10, 12, they never hear the number three, so they think that's not possible. So, ooh, sight word. Grapefruit. I got to go back and read this chat because I know there's a whole lot of things going on um, in the chat. Great ideas for me too. Um, I'm going to clear. Do you want to keep putting out uh, counting or green check mark with the polling tool if you're ready to go on to another idea? Doesn't mean you have to stop typing. If you've got other counting ideas, keep them going. Perfect. I've seen enough screen checks and and no X's, so I think it's time to go on to the next. So here's that slide again um, where I put up um, before without the annoying yellow box this time. Um, these are the operational sense, not all of them, but some of the operational sense expectations that come out. And as we've already talked about, column on the left involves using concrete materials. And the column on the right just is um, same grade, but now they're only relying on their um, mental strategies. 
Notice the verbs in all five of the six say solve a variety of problems or solve problems. And, and uh, the first column in grade three talks about just adding and subtracting three-digit numbers. And we'll get to that point later. So I teach through problem solving, and I encourage everybody specifically to teach through problem solving. Maybe some of you have been in one of my sessions before on the three-part or the five-part lesson. And again, as I said earlier, if you haven't and you're curious or you're interested in my ideas on that, you could search the archives or just get in touch with me on Twitter or my email, which I'll share at the end, and I'll send you some of my, my thoughts on the three-part lesson. So I would do a minds-on very briefly, and then I would have students and partners go off and solve a problem, and it will be problems, and it will be hard for them, and they won't be able to know the answer right away, because I don't teach math in units anymore. So one day we might be doing an addition problem, and the next day we might be doing a measurement problem, and then the next day there'll be a graph, and I will know that my um, thread going through them all is maybe comparing quantities, but the students don't necessarily know that. And um, so it will be a problem for them. It won't be like, well, yesterday we added and the day before we added, so today we're probably going to add again. Um, but here is a problem that I would give to a grade one class during the working on it time. So they'd be solving this with a partner. Uh, my friend Mrs. McCabe teaches a grade one two class. She has nine grade one students and eight grade two students in her class. How many students are in her class? I could do that because of the expectations. I could address either of those grade one expectations. So here's where the intentionality comes in. If I want my students to gain practice at the top expectation, I'm going to encourage them to use manipulatives. If I'm going to be assessing them on the second expectation, the one I've written at the bottom, it won't be um, an option for them to use the manipulatives because it's supposed to be the mental strategies only. So again, here's that intentionality where it really um, pays off if you're mindful and uh, specifically attack one of the expectations so that the assessment data you get is very, very rich. So if I chose the first one and a student does this, is there a feedback that you could give the student? So again, just to go back and forth, sorry to make you dizzy, nine grade one students, eight grade two students, how many students in her class? Not hard for us as adults, hard in beginning grade one. What feedback would you give the student? Knowing I'm addressing the expectation of solving problems involving addition and subtraction of whole numbers to 20 using concrete materials and drawings. Krista, going back to your question in the chat, Krista's asking about bouncing around and being concerned. Um, I think it's great, but my anchor charts are what help the students. So by the anchor charts I post in the class, that is what builds the students the thread from one idea to the next. So I'm not bouncing around ideas when I'm teaching, but the context of where that idea appears will look very different every day for students, if that makes sense to you. And then my anchor charts stay the same. So we, it might be a week of comparing or it might be a week of composing and decomposing or constructing and deconstructing. So we maybe do it for the number 12 and then we do it for shapes and then we do it for a graph. But my anchor charts for that week are pull, building the whole idea of what you can take apart in math and put back together in different ways so it's more useful. That would be the big idea I'd be building. Okay, so I see that all of this is great. Know, too, that a student would never just do this for me. They would also be talking to me as they do it. I gave this as their next step.
Do you see why? And then, from here, I gave them this as their step after that. And then maybe to that. And then go to there. Because I think to take a student who did this to the 10 frame is too big of a jump. So you see how complex this is for a student. We often apply our adult understanding and we think, oh, it's easy, you're just 9 and 8, 17. But for a student who's just building this concept of addition, this progression is really helpful for them to build their conceptual understanding. Because again, I don't care about the procedure and I almost don't care so much about the right answer. I care really about what the kids are thinking about. When we go through a progression like this, then they start to see all the ideas. It really helps me, too. A student who does this, the next day, they can do this. That's a reasonable improvement to accomplish between one, one day of class time. And then we just go from there. And some will put only the red on top and only the black on the bottom. And then your next step is, well, can you make 10 out of something? And they might have pulled two red down into the block to make a 10. It's still going to give them the same thing. So Andrea has asked the question, would I tell them to color code? What if nobody in the class has color coded? I would have a picture or I would do it and I say things like, you know, I saw somebody answer this problem doing this. And then my big question in consolidation is, how is it the same and how is it different from what you did? So how is it the same and how is it different is a question I ask almost every math lesson I teach. Because it really brings the kids thinking about what they did and what something else is. And again, I'm building understanding. And then in my consolidation, we'll talk about, does it help to use the color breakdown? And they'll probably agree yes. Okay, and then I'll go forward from there. So after this day, it's like, oh, I saw somebody solve it like this. Why does that make sense? And again, if we've done good with our quantity, because this, remember, is in the expectation of operational sense, but in the quantity expectation, it talks about benchmarking to 5 and 10. And I know in the FDK program, benchmarking to 5 and 10 is big too. So they should already be quite comfortable with the notion of making tens or fives even because you could do this with five frames if the child is, is happier with fives. So there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so we go on, we go on. So we've done this problem. We've scaffolded the representation. And here's something I'll say. I might have done all this without paper, without having the students ever written anything on paper, especially in grade one. The thing I've come to believe is that paper kills learning in primary. As soon as we give them pencil and paper before they have the understanding, a really solid understanding, we undermine them. We take away their thinking because now they're trying to think about how to write it down on paper and they don't even understand the concept. So imagine trying to record something that you don't understand on paper using a series of symbols that you don't really know what they mean either. So for a whole lot of grade one, I would do all my assessment without paper. We have all kinds of apps and, and maybe um, if you know a great app to archive, and I think I've got that question later, but there are lots of ways that we can still archive the data from their thinking or archive their achievement on our performance task without having them do anything on paper. And I really strongly believe that that is a big reason why we have a mass phobic society is because people took it to paper a lot too quickly before 
um, lots of people had an understanding of what it was they were trying to write down. And then they fell into the trap of, I don't understand it, but I know if I just do these five steps, I'm going to get an A. And that's okay with me, even though I don't understand it. So think very carefully of, of when you bring in paper into your primary classroom. Definitely not until the end of the unit, I would say. And in grade one, I don't know. You'd have to put out a pretty strong argument um, for me to believe that you were helping them learn a new concept through paper. Practice, anchor an existing concept that they've already solidified, absolutely. But in terms of learning, I think it kills learning. Oh, so before I do that, what would her next step be? You've got this class, you've done a series, you've scaffolded them on the representation using the concrete materials. The next problem, they've done it again, they're all putting it on a 10 frame. What do you do next? What are your ideas if you want to build on this expectation still? The same expectation, which again says solve a variety of problems involving addition and subtraction of whole numbers to 20 using concrete materials and drawings. What's the next step? Also, Erin's got an idea of really opening it up. You might want to say, Erin, how many might be in grade one and how many are in grade two? Awesome. And Margaret, if we know it's best for students learning, we got to stand up to admin who want to see paper and parents. Absolutely. We got to fight. Our kids need us to fight that battle. We've got to break status quo. I think I said on a one uh, webinar last year, we need some really brave teachers to be mavericks and really change what classrooms look like. Otherwise, schools are going to be redundant. Kids can learn stuff on YouTube and maybe faster than, than when we drag it out through a traditional kind of teaching situation. So they need us to be brave and be mavericks. Go for it. That's how kids are going to learn. So you had some great ideas, um, this whole openness. Ah, other opportunities to do different strategies, doubles and doubles plus or minus one. I tend to stick that more when I'm doing my mental math, but absolutely, Kit, it would make sense. Here's where I would go. I'm not reading it for you. And I intentionally worded this question. I put the word all together in. What do you think students are going to do? They will absolutely add those two numbers together and tell me quite happily that there are 26 students with laces. Because a lot of times teachers have told them, look for the word all together. And when you see the word all together, it means add. So we have to be careful about telling students these little tricks. And yeah, I just did air quotes as I said tricks. Okay? We just want them to think about the situation and apply common sense. We don't want them to perform a little trick to get a right answer. Because the right answer is only going to work in that situation. And it's never going to come up in their life again. We want them to reason and have common sense dealing with number. So I always put words like this. I often put the year in a question. In 2016, Mrs. McCabe's class, you know, and all of a sudden 2016 gets added in because that's what they're doing, even in grade one. So, so what kind of question this is? This is maybe thought traditionally as a subtraction question but it still addresses that expectation of a solving a variety of problems involving the addition and subtraction. And I'm going to make a point, but I think it's going to come out better in another slide. When we teach, we tend to teach problems that are structured in the response unknown format, and that's the top one. We need to give students opportunities to wrestle with problems that either have the start unknown or the change unknown. These are what show up on EQAO and then teachers cry that they were trick questions. But they're not trick questions. It says right in the expectations that they have to solve problems like this. 
these involve, the second problem involves the addition and subtraction of, gray, of whole digit numbers to 20. And, Susan, I don't know if I put this link on this slide or someone, some slide neighboring, but all of this in terms of types of problems, I pulled a PDF out of the Effective Guides to Instruction, and it's just on types of problems. And if you haven't read those Effective Guides, you should go back and read them, because there's a whole guide on how to teach um, basic facts. So here's another one. This is a more traditional subtraction question. But it's so much like the ones that we've already done. And I would build these anchors in my class. So on the wall, I would have this question with student replies. And I would post it right beside the question on the shoelaces versus Velcro, right beside the question on grade 1 students and grade 2 students to help kids see whatever different strategies they feel comfortable with are going to apply to all those types of problems. Because you can solve a subtraction question by counting up. And you can solve, well, you can't solve an addition question by subtraction. But for those that hate subtraction, and lots of people do, you can always solve it with addition. You can solve every single subtraction question using addition. So there, Susan put that link there. That's just a PDF. I did not make that. I just pulled it out of the effective guides because I really think it's important that we understand part, part, whole kinds of questions, the joining, the separating, and then even the comparing. So there are 17, there are um, apples and oranges in a bowl, and there are 17 pieces of fruit. There are more apples than oranges. How might the fruit be distributed? between apples and oranges. That would be another part, part, whole question, but it's not a traditional adding question. It, it's much more of a comparing. Absolutely, Lois, I love your idea of having students choose their own numbers. I do that a lot. I will say things like, um, you know, Billy has some cars and John has more. How many do they, how many might they have all together kind of thing or leave out the word altogether because I don't want to lead them down the road. Understanding this, I'll clear those green checks in the polling tool. Moving forward. Absolutely, Krista, the idea of comfortable numbers, comfortable for the kids to pick, and then that's when you as teacher can get in and push them gently towards what once was uncomfortable for them. Once they've built their understanding with comfortable numbers, then you use their understanding and broaden their range of what numbers feel comfortable to them. So we're good to go on. I'm mindful of the time, too. So knowing what the expectations are, well, what do you notice about this sheet? I'll just ask that. Well, I flip pages. What are you noticing about this? When, what comes to mind when you see this? And when might you use this? Mad minutes. Are you trying to kill me, Mandy? I'll just like restart my heart. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. This is how I learned. That's exactly what I think, too. There is no regrouping. OK. So here's my question, and you might want to just answer in your head because I'm not trying to call anybody out on anything. This is questions involving the addition of two-digit numbers. Could you use this for a grade two assessment? I didn't say have you. I sure have. We're not supposed to use it for assessment, because when you go back and look at our um, expectations, grade two, all the computations they do are in the context of a problem. So when we give students a worksheet, 
we should not be just scoring it and using it as assessment data. Our curriculum tells us that's not appropriate. It says when we assess them, we're assessing their ability to solve problems involving, tell us only two operations, and they tell us what number range. They tell us if they can use their um, only mental strategies or if they're allowed to use concrete, and not if they're allowed to, but they must use concrete manipulatives. So we have to be really careful that what we, our practices in the classroom actually align with what our curriculum asks us to do. So no, it's not for grade two assessment. I guess it could be for diagnostic if you're, if you're um, looking for something specific, you've got a question if they're ready for something, um, but it's not for um, assessment. Oh, I know, Nick, parents want this because that's what they had, but the problem is when we all did these worksheets, half of us who went to school at this time are scared to death of math. So I'm not sure why parents want the same thing repeated for the new generations because this type of work did not create a math literate society. Some people are. Some people are deathly afraid. I mean, there are teachers who are afraid to teach anything higher than primary math because they're not confident in their math skills. And, and that, to me, says that there's a problem with how all of us were taught math. So um, we need to go on. And yeah, we are the professionals. We know about learning and we know about um, teaching math and we're backed by our curriculum. And in fact, if we do this, we're actually not doing our job. So I do feel quite passionately about that, but I won't get on my soapbox for much longer. I would agree, Jennifer, I wouldn't use it as a diagnostic, but I'm not going to ever say that all worksheets are bad. For example, this worksheet. It's a worksheet, and I might intentionally bring it into my classroom to help a group of students start to understand the whole make a 10 to add. Would I give it to a whole class? Not anymore. I would give it to those who need the practice. I wouldn't give it to those kids that can already make a 10 to add because that just kills the excitement for learning new things. If you make kids be compliant and do rote things that are too easy for them, that's boring. And I don't want to intentionally bore our kids. So I might do this sheet, small group instruction. I'm being very intentional with the kids in my group. It's not a random worksheet that I quickly found. It's something specific to target a need that I see for students. Probably I think there's a better way, but if I go the worksheet way, uh, route, I want to be very intentional about what the worksheet is practicing or developing and who is doing the worksheet, without a doubt. Because that kind of gets rid of, well, I kind of say there's a teaching by Pinterest kind of um, movement in education now where people find something online and it's fun or it's cool and people say they found it and their kids love doing it and I'm thinking that's not a reason to do it in your classroom. It's a reason to do it in your classroom if they're going to learn something and if maybe not, it's not necessarily a whole class task if it can be more interest-based. So those that are interested could do it. Same thing with um, textbooks. I would never say don't use a textbook. I don't use it start to finish. I'm very intentional about what pages I use. Often I just use the textbook as a source of problems or maybe calculations. But know, too, that no textbook is perfectly aligned with our Ontario curriculum. So the textbooks are, are written to only meet, and I can't remember the percentage now, but I'll say roughly 70% of our expectations. So for example, in some of the curriculum, or some textbooks, you're going to find fractions with standard notation. Because in maybe British Columbia, they arise in the grade two curriculum. Maybe in Newfoundland, they arise in grade one. But in Ontario, they don't show up till grade four. So we have to know what our curriculum says so we know what parts of a textbook we should be doing. The other thing about textbooks is that there may be whole chapters or whole sections of the book that aren't even in our curriculum. So our curriculum is packed enough that we need to have all the time we can on our expectations. We don't need to do a couple extra units that aren't even in our curriculum. 
So I'd never say they're bad, but I'd say that we need to be very intentional with, with how we use them and make sure that we're um, aligning to our curriculum. So Melissa asked a question in the chat about having problems. When I teach through problem solving, as they are learning the concept, they are always working with a partner. So I do three-part lessons a lot, and I do guided math groups, and I will do three-part lessons that have maybe three different problems going on at a time so that students are working um, in their zone of proximal development, I guess, really, where it's not easy for them, but it's doable. With a friend, they can probably reason through it and, and get it done. So similar ability partners depends. I would never put my highest, my most um, proficient math student with my least proficient math student. I tend to partner using, um, I call them near neighbors. So my, my strongest might be with my uh, fourth strongest, and then my second strongest will be with my fifth strongest, third with six, and then seven might be with my tenth strongest. So I kind of waterfall down if I rank. But I always use their independent practice. So my structure is minds on, working on it with partners. We do consolidation where I highlight the math. Um, those first students share what they did to solve a problem. Then I highlight my learning intention. And then I give them independent practice so I can gauge how individually they have done meeting that learning intention. And then I quickly assess those by putting them met, not met. So I just quickly go through their, their work met, not met, met, not met, and then I use that data to partner students for the next day. That tells me which pair of students might be ready for the next concept in a problem, which students need to go back and, and redo kind of today's lessons ideas again um, with a partner. And maybe, for example, if it was counting, maybe I'm going to realize I've got students that don't have one-to-one -one correspondence yet. So there's no sense me keeping on in the counting unless I can fill that one-to-one uh, -one gap for them. So that's, as I said, that's a whole other webinar. That's a whole 90 minutes on its own. Uh, Jameson, on any given day, I wouldn't pair um, high to low. But when I decide who my high was, I'm only deciding on the last thing they did. I wouldn't ever say that I've got a top math student because I find that when you really go through the expectations, some kids that are really good with their computations have very weak geometry and spatial sense skills. So the top student changes all the time. And so I don't know. I'm pretty flexible with my groupings. Absolutely. Whiteboards all the time. Um, very mindful of time. Assessment. If we're not using paper pencil, where do you bring in assessment into any of this, especially if you're not using a worksheet? Um, I tend to use an app called Explain Everything. Anybody familiar with that? It's an interactive whiteboard app. Love. Similar would be um, EduCreations. And there's a third one that's very similar. I even just grab photos. I grab photos and pick collage. Um, and put in labels. And then we are a Google board, so I can just drop it right in their Drive account. I have folders in Drive accounts with every child, so I kind of have a mark book that's just a digital file on my cloud account. Um, that app again, I use Explain Everything and Edu Creations, Pick Collage. There is one more whiteboard app that, again, I'll blurt it out later. I don't know if I blurted out the other thing I said I would. Um, Matthews has one. Awesome. Show me. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. Show me. That's exactly it. Maybe explain everything, I think, Shelley. Yeah. They're on the iPad. I don't know if you're Android. I know there are some, um, but I'm not familiar with those. Um, I use these. I take pictures. I capture the kids' voice talking about it. When I taught FDK two years ago, the students were able to take a picture of their math, make a video of it, and talk about it 
annotate it because you can annotate on the picture. So when they're talking about the tower they built, how they knew which one was taller, they could show you know the difference between the two heights. And then I actually had them know how to email it from the iPad into um, I was using um, oh it's got the elephant. Somebody help me now. It's that curating tool. It's kind of gone out of bad favor now. Evernote, thank you, into their Evernote files. So if FDK kids can do all that, all kids can do um, the annotations or the documentation of their assessment. Paper is not needed anymore in, in primary, not even for the assessment. And I found, too, that when you show a parent a video of a child solving a math problem or talking about their work, the parent kind of is really happy because they just know exactly what their kids are thinking and then at report card time you can give them a next step and they very clearly can see why that next step is appropriate and understand what that next step might be. Yeah, I hear about Seesaw. I haven't got any experience. I'm in the in the library now in the Learning Commons makerspace, but um, I got to figure that one out. So going to grade three. Grade three is the first time you could assess students just by giving them a calculation. So absolutely about that data. Sorry, my eye went back to this because that's the point. Who owns the data with all these apps? And if it's free, there is a cost. They're data mining or, or something like that. So absolutely, we do need to be very mindful of that. So going back to my other thought, see it's like a squirrel ran by and my, my attention's drifted. Grade three, our curriculum says we can present students with just the raw calculation. It specifically says add and subtract three-digit numbers um, without solving the problem. And I have to believe that because it's the only one, it's intentional, that they feel that in grade three they should be able to handle calculations outside of a context. So the other point I'll make, I have intentionally written it horizontally. And I do that on purpose because if I write it vertically, I'm leading them falsely to a belief that I want them to apply the standard algorithm. So lots of people who have done lots of research in this say when we present questions to students, we should write it horizontally. Something for you to consider if, if that's not in your practice. So what if a student did this? A student did this actually the other day, but their writing was not good, so I rewrote it. Grade three student hands you this. It's not in context, so they're not having to represent or explain their thinking or justify. They're just doing this. What is your comment to the student who submits this? <laughs> I agree, Sharon. Mental math on paper. Exactly. And why can't the math that we ask kids to do on paper look exactly like the math they do in their head? I've said this before in some of my extra, um, other, sorry, not extra, additional sessions. If I were to put a big pile of money in front of you and ask you to count it, you wouldn't start with the pennies and the nickels and the dimes. You would start with the big bills and you'd pull them all out and you'd count those and then you'd go down to the toonies and loonies and quarters and dimes and then eventually get to the little stuff. That's how our brains tend to want to do math and adding, except when we get to class and then we teach them you have to start with the littles on the right. And so students, what, what do you know a student understands in this? They understand place value. Absolutely they do. Compare it to this. When you're supporting a student with the traditional algorithm, and, and know too that it's only a traditional algorithm in some places. Others have their own algorithms that are standard. So it's kind of funny that we hold this as you know the grail that we're all aiming towards because it's not. 
a lot of times we would say 9 plus 7 is 16. Write down the 6, carry the 1, right? That's what we would say. Well, 1, the, the, some students in your class are looking for you to actually pick up and carry something physically because the word carrying doesn't make sense to them in math. And if you have just done your place value unit or work on that, they're wondering why you're talking about a 1 because it's, you're carrying a 10, but we say carrying a 1. And then we say 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6, but that's not 6, it's 60. And then we'd say 3 and 4 is 7. So students who are doing the traditional algorithm on the right, we might actually be understanding their place value, understanding, and not really building their concept of what addition is in terms of grouping numbers into a larger whole when we're working with positive integers. So I like the one on the left. Now a great problem is asking, do you see the, the one on the right? Where does that show up in the calculation on the left? And how can you explain that? Now that's really great thinking. And when they can talk to you about that, then it makes sense for them to just do the algorithm on the right, if they choose. My rule in class is they can't put anything on the paper that they can't explain. So as soon as a student says, carry the one, I say, you can't do this strategy. Because there's no one and there's nothing being carried. If they want to talk about regrouping the 10 and moving it to the tens column, that's a totally different explanation than saying carrying the one. Same problem. What if they did this? So again, the problem. Going back, 329 plus 437. Students does, does this. I agree, Nick, we really can see. And again, somebody made the point earlier, it's like their mental math has shown up on paper. I love that idea. Yeah, number talks is big. If we can really get, as a province, get good at doing those number talks, specifically with the ones from the book, or just in general, I think we'll be in a better math boat, so to speak. What about this? And these are examples that I saw. The book is called Number Talks, and I don't know the author. Maybe somebody here will know it. Um, it's blue. It's very classroom friendly. They're little scripts of questions that you ask students, and then you have questions. They've done a great job to give you the questions to ask to build understanding for uh, mental math. Sherry Parrish, thank you very much. See, crowdsourcing, the room is always smarter. <laughs> Going back to this number line, any comments? Her number strings, yeah, Fosno's good too, for sure. Thank you, Susan. Susan put the link for the uh, Amazon. That should be a three, yes, you're right, sorry, at the top, Sorry, my mistake. It's a 300, plus 300 on the first jump. Thank you so much. So you're adding the 300, and you were really supposed to add 329, but they added 330, and then just did the compensation at the end and subtracted the one. Oh, let's go back to the other one. So what they didn't do, they just mentally added the 300 and the 400 together and started at 700. And then they knew that they had 50 in the tens columns, so they added that. And they had 16 in the ones, so they did a jump of 10 and a final jump of 6.
And that's how they did that. And number lines are really powerful. So powerful that Dr. Lawson did a whole little clip on the power of the number line. And because I'm mindful of time and because the video is 10 minutes and there might be questions, Susan will probably put the link in the chat. And I think we won't watch it right now altogether. But if you haven't seen this um, clip, I've shown it in a few other webinars and at the Summer Institute, lots of people say this is a game changer for how they, how they support number sense enumeration in their class. So I highly recommend that you take 10 minutes and um, look back at, at this video. Really, really powerful video. But here's my next point, and I'll give you a second for this. I'm assuming I'm going to get lots of the LOLs. And so when I'm teaching number sense, um, and everything had to be through problems except for one of the grade three expectations, I need a big bank of problems that I use for students. And the whole thing about having problems in, is that they provide a context so that the students can rely on their common sense and their past experience to make sense of a, of a new problem, a new concept that they're being introduced to. I heard a ding. Was that a ding for me? Well, maybe it was an LOL. Somebody just wanted me to know. Awesome. So. My point is, and a lot of teachers say, well, it has to be real life. So we make problems about shopping, and we make problems about an adult real life. For students, the only shared real life they have is their classroom. So I would say that when you're providing problems for primary students, they have to be about their classrooms. You have enough things to, in your classroom to make problems that you know, work up to those number ranges. And so I would say with very few exceptions, and especially early in your unit, or early in a uh, student's understanding of a concept, the problem should be about school or their classroom. Maybe go to the library, grade three, when you're starting to get into, you know, three-digit numbers. And I know this because when I taught in Drayton, Ontario, which is a very small rural town, that was the year that on the grade six, uh, sorry, the junior EQAO assessment, there was a question about an alley. And there are no alleys in Drayton. They had no clue what they were doing. They could all find the area of a rectangle, but they couldn't picture the alley, so they had no idea that that was the math skill they should have been using to tackle that question. Had we asked, had the question been, you know, about a furrow, they would have aced it, and then the GTA would have been out of luck on that one. So it's really important that when we make problems meaningful for students, we don't need them to spend their cognitive energy to understand the situation. We want the situation to be very familiar to them so that their energy can go towards building their math understanding of that concept. And we can't even talk about vacations, and we can't talk about things because we're excluding a group of students in our class. The only shared and common experience we can be sure of are things that happen in our classrooms. And so I think that that's a big um, thing to consider when, when you're creating these problems for students to solve. Absolutely, vocabulary is the issue, but I don't think it's going to be the issue if you're talking about lining up or you know comparing groups of students and maybe your word walls and, you know, you've labeled your classroom in such a way that the whole vocabulary might not be as big an issue for students when they can actually see it and manipulate them. The other great thing is the acting out strategy is awesome, right? If, if we want to solve that grade one, grade two problem, we get the grade ones to go on one carpet and the grade twos to go stand on the other carpet and we can solve the problem really physically and they can act it out. And for a lot of our primary kids, that's going to be really important. Ah, yeah, see, we can all think of examples of kids that 
you know, they could probably have done the math had they known that that what was being asked of them. I think this is my last slide. Don't spend oodles and oodles of time doing number sense units and number sense lessons. Spend a lot more time doing perimeter. Just make sure that when you're doing a perimeter question, you're keeping your numbers in the number sense range. And when you're creating graphs and asking students to compare data on the graphs, make sure it's in the range of numbers that they're supposed to work on in the number sense strand. Be really intentional when you bring a number into your class. Because if you are, you can get assessment data for two strands at once, which takes off the, you know, a lot of pressure. You can do two birds with one stone, three birds with one stone kind of thing. You have more time to spend really building their understanding. I think teachers sometimes get frazzled because they think, oh, I've got to do, you know, every specific expectation and I'm going to take a week on every expectation, every specific expectation, and very quickly you run out of weeks. But when you start to work more strategically and with that intention, you have a lot more time to slow down and give kids an opportunity to really build their understanding. We've already talked about it several times. You know, you were coming up with examples of, of where else those connections were, the patterning and the counting and, and all sorts of things like that. Absolutely, Rhonda, they could have been field questions. That doesn't mean that the students were any less frustrated, though, when they were tackling them and just really frustrated that they didn't know where to, to start. Yeah, social justice and awareness into math. The other thing Kit, that I was thinking about is I often did problems about girls and boys and uh, asked students to identify, you know, there were gender questions, but really they were sex questions. And we have some students now that are identifying not to either boy or girl. So again, I eliminated all those boy-girl questions out, and now I've got Velcro and laces and eye color and grades. Fortunately, they're all split grades, so I can you know, got lots of <laughs> problems right there. And, wow, you have five minutes to ask any question that you have. Ask it of me, ask it in the chat room, and somebody else can reply. The only other thing I have is my Twitter, which has also been beside my name, and Susan put it in the chat earlier. And, There you go. There is my email, and I am pretty good at replying. If you have a question, I can maybe reply quickly because I've done more webinars, and I can just send you a slideshow from before or put you in touch with somebody else who knows or a, a link to an archive. So I'm happy to answer questions. Nick, my hunch is that our grade 1 to 8 report card will very quickly be going the way of the uh, FDK um, report card. So they talk about their four frames. I can see us reporting more on the six C's of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, um, et cetera, et cetera, and, and going that way. So that would really be awesome. And we could teach math not by strands and in silos and actually just teach them to make sense of the world and the patterns and the numbers that they see all around. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, Crossing my fingers. Can I just time. jump in here for a moment before people start to disappear? I, I, I see a lot of great thank yous and comments, oh, which is awesome. Oh. And I'll just add my thanks as well, Mary Kay. It was just such a thoughtful session once again and a great time of year for us to think about this as we move into a year of math teaching. So I'm going to thank you. I'm going to thank all of you as well for coming tonight. We've had lots of newcomers that are saying, hey, my first session and I really enjoyed it. Hope you'll come back. I'm going to stop the recording now and I have a couple of other slides with some information to share with you, um, and then I'll turn it back to Mary Kay to answer any questions.